and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A mere eight feet from us is the largest predator in Africa. The male lion, there's not one, but three. This is Safari Live. Confirm you're going live. No way! The big male baboon's chasing her. Remember, you are watching this live. What did you see? We've got to be quite careful with these guys. Unfortunately, I think this is the end. You have your fire! Oh, look at the nose! There's a herd of zebra. This is the most epic thing in the world, ever. Good morning, good morning. Once again, you find yourself suspended above Africa on the fourth of eight live safaris brought to you from one of the world's most iconic wildlife areas. Dawn has brought with it gray skies and slices of golden sunshine. It's 76 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is James Hendry, and I am hanging in a tree. Why am I hanging in a tree? Well, because I like to hang in a tree, and I'm going to be talking to you from the safari tent for the next two hours. You're going to talk to me via Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. Now, I must apologize on behalf of the South African Postal Service. They have been dysfunctional for five years, so please do not send letters or postcards. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter is the only way you may get hold of us. Let's look at where we are in the world. We are at the southern tip of Africa, the northeast corner of South Africa, and the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park, eight and a half million acres of untrammeled wildlife wilderness. I have magicked myself back into the tent. Last week, we spent a wonderful time with the prince and princess, Hosanna and Shongile. They were cavorting around in the mud and climbing trees. We had an awkward time with a male lion who was well. Not to put too fine a point on it, tried to get it on with the female lioness, who had no desire at all and swatted him mercilessly with her claws. Steph, who was out on foot, took a bath. We've met Brent today. He's with the lion. Steph is knocking about here somewhere. I think he's looking for elephants. And Jamie Patterson has refound the royal family. Good morning and welcome to another bright and beautiful dawn out here in the middle of the wilds of Africa. And what a spectacular start once again to this, the fourth of our live safari experience. My name is Jamie and this morning Viam is on camera with me. And we have started off our morning in the best possible way. Because believe it or not, in the tree that is directly behind me, it holds a very special secret in the form of this spotted cat laying up in the branches of this bush willow. Now, last week you had the opportunity to once again follow the amazing games of the royal family, those two special little cubs, Hosanna and Shungile. What you were looking at earlier was a relatively recently deceased impala, and in the tree lies the reason behind the deceased impala. Now, this is little Hosanna or Little Chief, or Little Prince, as he is known. And for those of you that perhaps are new to these live safari experiences, he is just two weeks shy of his first birthday. And he's all alone. Mom has managed to catch an impala, and Mom being, of course, the famous Queen of Juma, Karula, that beautiful female leopard. And she's brought him through but he's all alone. So where is mom? I think that the Queen of Juma has gone off in search of her errant daughter, Shungile, who we were with yesterday afternoon, hanging out in a marula tree. Uh, hopefully, if we sit patiently and wait, we shall see the return and reunion, and then hopefully the breakfasting of the royal family. But while we wait patiently, let's head back over to Brent and those magnificent male lions. And look at this, isn't this absolutely glorious? Last week we only got to meet one of the Birmingham boys and on this live safari now we get to meet three of the dominant male lions in our little corner of the greater 
Kruger National Park, an eight and a half million acre wilderness wonderland that we get to call home. Now, my name is Brent Leo Smith. I have my very good friend on camera, Brian Joubert, and we are killer the Killer bees. bees. And that means we hope to find you the best and most killer sightings. But also, Brian is ably, oh, sorry, helped ably by his very hardworking thumb, who got a bit confused this morning and put on a leopard print type, and you probably should have put on a lion mane. Of course, this is live, so we never know what we're going to find out here. Yeah? And lucky enough, we're with the beautiful Birmingham boys, and uh, Jamie is with those incredible leopards. Isn't this just too amazing? Now, this is coming to you at the exact same time as we are seeing it. This is live from South Africa. And remember, if you want to ask us any questions, hashtag Safari Live. I would love to hear from you. So please send those questions through. Now, if you have been watching for the past, well, four weeks now, we're in the middle of your eight-week weekly dose of live African wildlife. Uh, we've only seen one of the Birmingham boys, and that's the one who's in frame at the moment. His name is Mfumo, which means the authority. And you can see he's got quite a nasty scar on his schnoz. And that is probably from uh, fighting with one of his other coalition members, or from uh, attempting to be amorous with a, a lioness who wasn't so amorous back. And that's what happened last week. And there, the next line along there is called Tinyo, the tooth. And you can just see a scar uh, on the top of his cheek there. And that was definitely from a lioness who wasn't feeling that amorous. And uh, she split his lip. And you can see his tooth when he's sitting up. And then the third line, which is quite exciting for me, is not one I get to see too often. And it looks like... It is Nena. Uh, Nena means the warrior. So there's one missing. His name is Mtsogo, and that means gold. He's got a very golden mane. Now, these three lions control a massive part of this part of the world. They control about 20,000 acres, three different prides. Now, Chelsea's asked a very important question because, as you would have noticed, I am sitting incredibly close to these massive male lions. Uh, Chelsea would like to know, what is the limit to how close we go to the big cats? Now, Chelsea, these big cats have grown up with safari vehicles, so they are habituated. They don't see us human beings sitting in there. But this is about my limits. I'm never going to push further than that. But the wonderful thing about being out here is that the lions don't have any limits. So sometimes I've had them walking right here that I could actually almost touch them if I wanted to. Uh, and if the animals choose to come close to us, we let them. We don't force ourselves into their space. Now, of course, you've met James, you've met Jamie, and you've met me and Brian. But there's one more person you need to meet, and he's probably the bravest of us all, because he's out here where all these incredible creatures live, except he's on foot. Let's go meet Steph. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, yes. My name is Steph Vinterboer, and you are on Bushwalk out here at Juma Private Game Reserve in exactly the same place that Brent and Jamie are dri or driving around on. Now, for those of you who have joined us for the previous three, this is the fourth of the Bushwalk in this eight-part series. And as you know, it's not always just about the big things like those lion and leopard. It's also a lot about the bush that they live in and also the tinier things in this particular region. And I've got something quite special to show you this morning just right in the beginning inside there inside that hole is a nest of the African honeybee now every now and again you'll see that a bee will come in and into and fly into the nest I'm hoping that it happened there we go there's a bee coming in two bees in actual fact came in now for me these little creatures are a lot more dangerous than that African male lion that you with with Brent and that's because I'm quite allergic to these little creatures but it doesn't make them any less fascinating. They've got a fearsome reputation, the African honeybee, for attacking sort of without provocation. But I haven't really found that in my own experience, to be honest with you. They tend to be quite placid unless you go and dig into, into their store of honey, which is, of course, a big delicacy for everyone living out here, including the local people that have been living here for thousands of years. Now, what they would have done is followed a bird called a honey guide. And that is exactly what I did to find this nest. Happened a couple of months ago, 
a honey guide or the greater honey guide led me with a series of chirping calls all the way to this tree and to that nest and I'm quite glad to see that the honey guide hasn't shown anyone else where this nest is in particular the honey badger which would have come in and tried to e excavate that honey now the tree that it's in is a silver cluster leaf tree which is near impervious to being opened by anything except the most determined predator and I'm sure that this bee colony is going to be here for months to come. Now, I don't know if you just noticed, there was a bee that came in there with bright yellow back legs. That little bee had pollen sacs that were full. They swim around in flowers and they collect pollen that is then stored in sacs on their back legs. Now, just before I go into what they do with the pollen and how honey is made, we are coming to you live from the African bush. The bush is incredibly thick at the moment because it is summer and every now and again we get a tree or a shrub in the way. So from time to time during this bushwalk, the picture might get a little bit fuzzy. Don't worry, don't go anywhere. We just have to move a little bit and it fixes itself. Now, back to how honey is made. So pollen is stored in the back legs of these little honeybees. They then go into to their nest they have little wax cubicles basically the comb that they put water and a mixture of saliva and the pollen in and gradually the water and this mixture or the water evaporates and the mixture ferments and it starts to concentrate into what eventually turns into honey and that is what they basically feed their babies with and humans and everything else out here as well all right on that we're going to carry on we are looking for elephant today so that is my mission today and we come into a part of the reserve that i haven't been into for ages literally a couple of months since the last time i found this uh, this beehive so it's going to be as about as much of an adventure for me as it is for you all right we're off to james he's got another type of bee to show you in his tent as I was saying, golden slices of sunshine coming in through the window here. Steph, very brave, of course. He is deeply allergic to the African honeybee. Now, I have something underneath the microscope. It's a giraffe. Can you see how big it looks? Now, inside the giraffe, of course, we have got a strange nest. Now, I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think this is. Hashtag Safari Live. Tell me what you think made this bizarre looking nest. And with any luck, well, the owners will actually come out. I'm just going to focus down into the bottom of this tube and hopefully they will pop out at some stage. I'll show it to you a little bit later and then explain to you what's going on in here. So hashtag Safari Live. Tell me what you think is living in my old friend, Gerald the Giraffe. And of course, it's very nice for Gerald the Giraffe that he is still a functional part of the wilderness out here. He died some time back, but still he manages to contribute to the wild. Well done, Gerald. Good. Now, last week we had obviously a great time with the Hosanna and Shongile. And you've met Hosanna again this morning. But they weren't just lying about this week. Take a look at what they got up to. Hosanna, the little prince, learned a bit about hunting. Here he seems to have caught a fearsome water monitor lizard. Looks a bit like a crocodile, but isn't. His manners leave a huge amount to be desired, and he's refused to share it with his mother or his sister. He carried it across the road there, you can see. Dropped it underneath the tree and lost interest. His sister then took over, Shongile that is, and she chose to practice her hoisting skills. Now that's a crucial ability for her adult life which will save her kills from scavengers. But clearly she's got a little bit to learn and rather like her brother, she found the reptile distasteful. But then, later that day, the ever resourceful Karula killed an enormous impala ram. It was a bit too large for her to pull into a tree, so the family fed on the ground, alternating between bouts of gorging themselves and resting in the shade. Luckily for them, flies were the only scavengers that came to share the meal, and the ram kept Karula, Hosanna, and Shungile thoroughly satiated and happy for the next three days. That, everybody, is the most quintessential African leopard shot you'll ever get in your life. Just beautiful, and hopefully we'll have a repeat of it sometime soon. Let's go and find out if Hosanna is ready to pose again with Jamie. So now that you have seen exactly what our royal family got up to during the week, you are back live on the vehicle with the 
cub concerned. The little Husana, who shows absolutely no sign of moving whatsoever. He seems to have decided that this is the most comfortable spot he could possibly be in, and that is where he wants to stay, which I have to, I have to confess, I am completely surprised by, because in my experience with Hosanna, he tends to be ravenous all of the time, as all teenage growing boys must be. And he seems to be quite relaxed. I don't know why it is that he hasn't fed off the Impala. Perhaps he managed to catch himself something to eat earlier. As you saw in that clip, already the cubs are at the point where they're not quite self-sufficient, but they are at this point able to hunt for themselves. They do catch small things, little meals, to help to keep them sustained whilst mom is out and away hunting. Luckily for Hosanna and his sister Shongile, their mother Karula is a most extraordinary huntress and has always provided for them in the most amazing way. Now, the exciting news is that I have heard a report that there is a leopard running along the southern boundary of Juma. That is probably Karula on her way back. It could also be his sister, of course. Either way, I think we're going to see this family reunion very soon. But while we wait for them to arrive, don't forget this is live. So you can actually ask any questions that you want to ask, and you can do that using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Uh, we've got this Impala kill over here that hasn't been fed upon at all, and little Hosanna um, comfortably in his tree. And while we have a brief look at the Impala, luckily relatively screened from our view, so we don't have to worry too much about the gory details. Nathan, welcome to our live safari. Nathan, you wanted to know how fresh that kill is. Well, Nathan, as it happens, one of the guides that works for Safari Live, Taylor, she actually saw Karula make that kill last night. So it is very, very fresh indeed. And only a little bit has been eaten. Karula's eaten a little bit of the rump. Apparently, she was starving after she killed it. Oh, hello. Are you up? Are you up? No? No, I'm just some spots hidden behind the leaves, and I'm not going anywhere perhaps showing a teenage boy's tendency to have a little bit of a lion this time of the morning. We can't even see your... There we... Oh, we almost saw your beautiful face, mister. He's extraordinarily big, this little cub. This not-so-little cub. He's actually nearly the size of his mom, and he's already showing signs of developing that massive thick neck and broad shoulders that he will have as he grows older and becomes more dominant in this area. Oh, while Hosanna snoozes as a patch of spots, giving us a perfect demonstration of his amazing camouflage. Mandy, thank you for sending through your question, and I hope you are enjoying this live safari. Mandy, you want to know how often leopards need to eat. They usually eat roughly once every two to three days, depending on the... Hey, there we are. There we go. Hello, little boy. Oh, look at those droopy eyelids. Definitely having a lazy morning compared to last week when you were dashing about like a goof. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Mandy. Um, the answer to your question is they eat roughly every two to three days, but it does depend upon the size of the meal. Uh, they can go for several days without managing to catch something or perhaps falling foul of local hyenas that will steal their kill. So it's always very, very circumstantial as to how often they eat, but it's usually every two to three days, especially for these little guys, since they have a, such an incredibly effective mum who manages to keep them so well fed. Oh, isn't he adorable? He's still cute. Even though he's nearly a year old and he's lost that fuzziness that he had when we watched him when he was two months old, he's still utterly adorable. And it's been such a pleasure watching these cubs grow up and getting to see them develop their individual personalities. I think hassan has got a little bit of goofiness about him, as he should. He goes swimming every now and again, which is very unusual for a leopard. You saw him last week with Brent climb into the pond and paddle about in the mud. And his sister Shongile, slightly more reserved, very graceful, with a very, very, I think, quite a determined streak to her. And I look forward to you getting to know each and every one of these leopard characters. Our while we sit with our gorgeous leopard, Laurie, you want to know why is the leopard not feeding on the carcass now? I honestly don't know. I have absolutely no idea why it is that Hosanna is not feeding on that carcass. I think he, he might be full, 
Uh, perhaps he feels a little bit insecure and he wants to stay in the tree. I'm really not sure. All I know is that at any moment now, his mom and his sister are going to return to us. So please don't go anywhere. Brent's with the lions. We've got this leopard and we will see you shortly after the break. And for those of you, of course, watching on the internet, you don't miss a moment of, I was going to say action. Not quite sure it's action, but you're not going to miss a moment of the leopard. There was a black-bellied busted calling earlier, but he's, oh, there, I think I can still see him. Oh, well done, Viam. There he is on the left there. There he is. My favorite. The most entertaining of all of the, well, not, not the most entertaining, but definitely one of the most entertaining birds that we get out here. Call for us quickly, please. Yes, no? You've been doing it all morning. Oh, it's almost like he knows the attention's on him now. Stopping to make sure all of his feathers are aligned in preparation for a TV appearance. One more call. Ooh, no, just an itchy chin. So for our new viewers, <coughs> this is a black-bellied bustard. One of the larger bird species that we see out here and they have a very unique call and that is what i want to show you it's like the popping of a champagne cork but of course because we put the camera on him and because this is live wildlife filming he's decided not to do it he's done it for the last hour there we go there we go Pop. <laughs> There we go. Thank you, black bellied bustard. Right, while we wait for the royal family to make their television appearance, let's head back to Brent and those lions. Well, they've got up as the sun has peaked over the eastern horizon and uh, a little bit of greeting going on there between, who's that, Nena and, uh, is that Mfumo or Tino? I think Mfumo. Nice to see the boys all together. It's not often we get to see this many together, so it is always great when we do. And, uh, oh, there we go. I don't think they're going to move too much today. I think they've all shared the buffalo nena court yesterday. It's not too far from here, but the Birmingham boys often will abandon a carcass. Oh, bless you. Okay, we're going to move around so we can have a look at their faces. Are we behind us there, Brian? Okay, let's get round. Things what we can call a lump of lions with their fat bellies. Happy Brian? Said, I don't think they're going to move too much this morning. We might go have a look at the carcass just now. And what's left, I think they've abandoned quite a lot of meat there. So who knows, there could be hyena, there could be vultures, or I'm sure they're vultures.
Welcome back everyone and we are back with the Lions of the Birmingham Boys. There are three of them here and of course you're on your very own privately guided live African safari. You'll see behind me there is a safari vehicle. There are other people in enjoying the sighting with us but the, we've got these three wonderful big males. They're not going to not being too entertaining at the moment. They're doing what male lions do quite often and that's snooze and they're snoozing because they've got bellies full of buffalo and uh, these boys are actually very successful hunters. There's that big misnomer that the male lions don't do any hunting but because they maintain such a massive area around 20,000 acres they have to do quite a lot of their own hunting. They control three. Oh bless you. I think that was a hairball. And a lion hairball is a vile thing full of bone and blood and rotting meat and of course hair. Now, Leslie's wondering uh, why do male lions hang out in packs? Well, Leslie, it's very, very important in this area especially. Uh, you normally never find single lions or even two lions together. Most of the time we have big male lion coalitions and there's a very important reason for this. This is one of the highest densities of lions in Africa. So if you're a single male by yourself it's going to be very very difficult for you to control a big area and make sure you can mate with lots of females and pass on your genetic material. So quite often uh, a lot of these coalitions will be related but not always uh, normally when they're about two and a half years old male lions are pushed from the pride and they become what we call dispersal males or nomadic males and uh, often they will meet up with other nomadic or dispersal males in that time and they form coalitions and if you're in a coalition you're able to control a much larger area you also may be able to control an area for much longer so if there's one of you the chances are you're going to get beaten up and bullied by a group so when there's a group of you you can control a bigger area more females more rights to mating and so it m makes sense for these lions to join forces now, sometimes there are different ages in the coalition. Here we look at they're all about the same age, about six years old. Uh, well, between six and seven, I'd say now. So this is a male lion's prime. He is at the top of his game here. They don't really have a lot of time at the top, only generally three or four years, sometimes five in a big coalition. Now, the reason for this uh, is they only really sire one set of cubs from a pride. Now, and the and that being so, if they stayed for too long, the females uh, that they've sired, so their daughters, would start becoming to three, four years old, coming into estrus, and they'd start mating with them. And so the reason male lions generally don't last too long is so the genetics don't get uh, overcomplicated. Uh, inbreeding in, in big cats is not nearly as a big issue as it is in human beings, but uh, generally you don't want them to inbreed more than three or four generations. But out in the wild, the way the animals are pushed, it stops that inbreeding altogether. Oh, this lovely light filtering through the, the clouds. Now Jim is wondering where these lions have recently fed. Uh, indeed they have and that's probably why they're so lazy Jim. So a big male lion with a full belly will often sleep around 20 hours a day. Uh, they killed a buffalo yesterday and I'm not sure how much meat they left there but we'll go have a look because I don't think these lions are going to move too far. So sometime during the next couple of hours we're going to go and check on that buffalo carcass. Now we're going to sit here for a little bit longer, make sure these lions don't get up to anything while we do that. And we're going to go from the biggest and one of the smelliest animals in the African bush to one of the most delicately and lightly scaled animals in the African bush with Steph. You know, sometimes it helps to get down to that lion level that those big cats that you're with are at and you'd be amazed at what you can see. This here is a butterfly that is busy resting here. It rested here last night. Butterflies are daytime creatures rather than their moth counterparts which are more nocturnal. And this particular butterfly is hanging on this piece of grass but orientated very specifically east-west. And that's important because the sunlight and the ambient temperature of the environment are what make butterflies so active during the day. And this butterfly would need the large surface areas of her wings pointed at the rising sun, which is 
opposite me, obviously uh, behind you at the moment, is where the sun is coming up. This butterfly specifically orientated herself like this last night, catching the last of the rays of the sun setting in the west, keeping her body nice and warm, and so that she can also then catch the first rays of the sun in the east. Butterflies are most active during the heat of the day. This particular butterfly will only start to really get active at around 10 o'clock. And right now, it's not much past 6.30, probably around about there some time. So she's still got a little bit of this morning hanging around upside down. Now, every little bit of scale on those wings, and they are made up of literally thousands and thousands of tiny scales, are orientated just so so that they can collect as much sunlight, like a very, very effective uh, PV panel, like a, um, an a solar panel that collects the solar rays and turns it into electricity. For us, this particular little creature collects solar rays and turns it into heat so that she can flit around as fast as she can, staying and avoiding birds going from flower to flower. Isn't that awesome? Very, very pretty. <laughs> I hear that Mr. Henry is rolling around in the grass, uh, enjoying himself immensely. So <laughs> enjoy whatever he's doing. I am rolling around in the grass, but I'm setting up a piece of demonstration. Now, my name is James Henry, in case you're wondering, and we have some answers to my astonishing microscope quiz. Sarah, Stacy, and Stephanie, you said alternately keratin, wasp, or ants. I'm afraid it wasn't any of those things. What it was, it was the opening tunnel to a stingless bee's nest that has been made inside some sort of cavity in that giraffe skull. Now, we're hoping they're going to arrive. I've just checked now. They haven't come back yet. I think they're probably inside actually and warming up so we put the skull in the sun and hopefully before the end of the show they will arrive now you saw Karula no you haven't seen Karula you saw Hosanna and you saw what she killed and round about dusk last night she was walking through the bush and as Jamie was mentioning they are camouflaged but in summer it's not so much camouflage it's hiding the bush is very, very thick, and she would have got to within about two meters, seven feet of an impala. That impala is not real, it's dead, everybody. It was killed some time back. Anyway, then what she would have done is exploded forward and grabbed the impala behind the head, tearing it to the floor wrestling it down onto the ground where she would have lain and panted, clasping it under the neck until it breathed no more. For a better demonstration of how leopards hunt, take a look at this. The leopard is nature's special forces operative, moving silently and invisibly through the woodland and savanna of Africa. To us, they are the epitome of sublime feline magnificence. To their prey, they are the soundless, unseen, but ever-threatening presence of death. The leopard's method is a patient, secret stalk, followed by an explosive pounce and then a lethal throat hold. Once dinner is dead, it must be secured from thieves. A pantry in a tree is an excellent solution. Look at that incredible strength. Oh, he nearly fell over. Look at how, look how high he's taken it. Absolutely incredible. But the wilderness has produced some persistent and ingenious villains. Because leopards are solitary hunters, they cannot afford to take physical risks, despite their often superior strength and speed. The scavengers know this. But time has not only blessed the leopard with the ruthless grace and power. Patience 
is a virtue leopards possess in abundance. With their poise and style, leopards must surely be the most elegant yet lethal of nature's hunters. And what perfect timing because look who has just arrived. You are back again with the live vehicle with not one, not two, but three gorgeous leopards reunited once again. And for the very first time on this live safari series, we can finally show you the dynamics between Karula and her two gorgeous cubs. Now you've just watched what impressive hunters leopards truly are. And Karula is one of the best in the business. She's managed to catch the impala and no rest for weary mothers. She then had to go and fetch one cub and then she couldn't find the other one. So she had to go and look for her daughter and she's finally managed to gather the two together. And she's currently giving her little son a thorough cleaning. What are you looking at? Ah, that's what you are looking at. A dove in a nest. I wondered what had caught the attention of that little cub. <laughs> I don't think so, little cubs. I don't think you should try and get all the way up there to try and get that dove. But I think he's going to. He's still looking. Ooh. This is why we love watching young leopards as they do all kinds of interesting and exciting things as they start to learn about their new world and as they start to explore and show all of that curiosity. Our mom has been gone for nearly two days and Dawson, you wanted to know how far a leopard will go for a kill. Um, they can walk for miles and miles, Dawson. Oh, cute. <laughs> oh, she's sort of happy to see him and sort of not. <laughs> Affectionate clean and then the odd snarl and growl, although I'd also be a little bit irritable if my large son slammed himself into me. Hello, Karula. Well done. Sorry, Dawson. Um, leopards can walk very far indeed, so they can cover many miles. Karula's walked basically the length and breadth of her territory yesterday. We tracked her all the way to the northern boundary, then she went all along the eastern boundary of her territory, and that is where she managed to catch this impala. Then she had to walk almost two miles back to where she left her cubs. So she's had a really hard two days. No wonder she was so hungry yesterday. She's had to work very, very hard in order to provide for these two growing cubs. Uh, if you have just joined us and perhaps you are new to this safari series, just a quick introduction to the leopards that you're seeing. They are known as the royal family of Juma and the two cubs are just shy of their one year birthday, which will be on the 2nd of February. So they are nearly, nearly a year old, one male, one female, the little female you can see in front of Karula, and that is Karula, their mother. Nearly 13 years old, and what an extraordinary leopard she is. <laughs> I love watching the dynamics between the three of them. <laughs> There's the put-upon mom, the beautiful queen responsible for the upbringing of eight leopards to adulthood and with two more on the way. So she really has done the most extraordinary job in terms of mothering. And over the last year and a half, we've had the serious, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her and see her techniques. And now she's hungry and she is on her way to the kill. And this is the joy of these live safaris is that all kinds of exciting things happen and we're about to see them go and feed. There she is, she's going right past the vehicle. And of course, Karula is so comfortable with the presence of our vehicle. And because she's so comfortable, her cubs are as well. There she goes on her way towards the kill. She is starving. She's going to go and munch on the, her breakfast. Oh, the question is whether or not her two little cubs are going to follow suit. Oh, here comes little Shungile. I love Shungile. She comes right next to the vehicle. The beautiful one, slim and slender and very graceful, just like her mom, trotting off after her on her way to breakfast. And as you can see, the joys of the live safari is that the unexpected is always around the next corner. So definitely don't go anywhere. We're going to be taking a short break, but I have no doubt that I will be seeing you all when we return once again. Oh, 
Okay, right. So for those of you watching on the internet, you don't miss a moment. I need to do some chatting to Aubrey quickly, who has just come and joined us. Hosanna is in a bush willow again. You little nut job. He always picks the skinniest branches to climb. You're not as tiny as you were, mister. I think perhaps it's going to take some learning curves to teach you that. You're a little bit heavier than you were when you were just a little bundle of fluff, bouncing around between the branches. All right, I think what we should do is just go and join Karula and Shungile while they feed. I'm certain he's gonna come along and join them as well. It was amazing listening to the approach of Karula. Could hear the alarm calls, the squirrels and the cesticulars. Everything sort of let us know in sections as she made her way into the sighting. And back to her son. Whoopsie, I nearly reversed Viam into a tree. I did reverse Viam into a tree. And hooked the car on a knob for. Which way is going to be best for us? Let's try and get ourselves in here. And get a good view of what they're up to. Here we go. Where's Shungile gone now? Karula's feeding. Where did Shungile go? The grass is so long now that if Shungile lies down, she disappears. Well done, girl. Yes, you should have some well-deserved breakfast first. You've done all of the hard work recently. Now she's managed to catch a full-grown Impala ram, which is good news for her, provided she can try and get it up into a tree. Plenty of food for the three of them. Definitely far better than a Dacre. She's got a, what is that blood on the back of her neck? Is that just a pop tick? Or did she hurt herself? Let's see. Looks like she might actually have injured herself when she was catching that, maybe when she was catching that Impala, I'm not sure. Doesn't look too serious though. But yes, good news is that there's plenty of food. Bad news is that there aren't really many trees for her to hoist it into. I'm not sure where, what she's going to decide to do or if she's going to manage to keep it. So hopefully between the three of them they can get as much as possible out of that carcass. Look at that. Instinctively burying the stomach contents, covering it up, making sure that the scent doesn't carry too far and attract hyenas. Where on earth did Shungile go? I'm trying to get an idea of where all all three leopards are, and they've managed to pull disappearing acts. Oh well, at least we've got the queen. And I'm sure the other two will show up in a moment. I had this image in my head of Karula walking Shungile back to the kill, giving her a very stern talking to about not staying put and disappearing and making her go and look for her. <laughs> just uh, having had the conversation myself in the past when I was a teenager, I could just imagine the words exchanged. All right, we're going to sit with the royal family, see what they get up to. Meantime, let's head back to James in the tent. I couldn't talk to you because the sound wasn't up. Hello, everyone on the internet, the old faithfuls. It's wonderful to be talking to you here. You know, much stress involved in the television. We're just setting up our next show, which is a preview for you, of course. We're going to be playing the game Two Truths and One Lie. Okay, David, does that work for you? And we'll come fact one, lie one, lie two, and lie three. Okay, there we are, everybody. I hope that you approve of David's shot selection my personal positioning, coffee cup with my name on it. And of course, for some of you, you'll recognize where that comes from, won't you? <laughs> naughty, naughty. 30 seconds, everybody. I'm going to come from the side, mobile, into the shot. That's right, David. 
David, director of photography, director. Fifteen seconds, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody, to your live safari from the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, part of which is the Great Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry, and you are on a live safari, the fourth of eight of them. Jamie is with the royal family of leopards. Brent is with some very sleepy lions, and Steph is knocking about on foot. Now, we're going to play a game called Two Truths and One Lie. Most of you will have played this before. The way you answer the question is to hashtag Safari Live, lie one, lie two, or lie three. Okay, lie one, lie two, or lie three. And the quiz today, or the game today, is about the dangers of Safari Live. Are you ready, David? Here we go. Lie one. Coffee cannot be drunk in the camp because the smell of it attracts scorpions. Lie two, more people are bitten by snakes in Africa than they are struck by lightning. Lie three, the most dangerous animal of safari live is the mosquito. There are baboons screaming at us. While we try and just see if we can't see them, hashtag safari live, lie one, lie two, or lie three. So those facts again, or those statements again, the baboons are in that tree there. Statement one, or lie one, is we cannot drink coffee in the camp because scorpions are attracted by the smell of coffee. And the second one was that lightning strikes more people than snake spite people in Africa. And the last one, the Anopheles mosquito is the most dangerous animal of safari live. Okay, I can't see the baboons. They're feeding on marula trees there, having an enormous fight of them. Okay, it's time now to take to the air. Now there are the lions with Brent. They're lying under a bush, as you can see. Now lions are extremely good at a few things, but the thing that they are very, very best at in all the world is nothing. They like to sit on the ground doing very little, and that's what they're doing now. Now we're going to head off towards Brent Leo Smith across this very verdant landscape where we've had lots of rain. In fact, in the last four weeks, since you joined us on these live safaris, we've had a huge amount of rain and everything's got greener and thicker. Now, you can probably just see Brent there. I think that's him in the top right-hand side of your screen. Is it? No, it isn't. It might, in fact, be a bush. There he is. There he is now. And he's sitting with something relatively distasteful. Let's go and find out what that distasteful thing is. Okay, so we are right next to this uh, buffalo carcass that was killed by those lions last night. Unfortunately, it, or not last night, yesterday morning, it's quite fresh, so it doesn't smell too bad, but there's this permeating smell of stomach content, but I don't want to touch the buffalo. It is, it is a little bit rank, but we've been looking here carefully, and there's about a few, quite a few different species of carrion flies and blow flies that have come to feed on this carcass. Nothing goes to waste out here. Now, the next little bit, is not for the squeamish, so I'm going to warn you ahead of time. As I get a little bit closer to this carcass, and the flies are buzzing all around me, if we have a look, there's a line of baby maggots moving from where they've been laid underneath this carcass and moving around all the way, trying to get into the skin here between the meat. Look at that, it's, it's literally like a, a river going uphill of tiny, tiny little maggots. Uh, as I said, not for the faint of heart, but nothing out here ever goes to waste. But I think it's enough time sitting next to a rotting carcass. We've got one more thing to show you here, because as I said, blah, 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 nothing goes to waste out here. And uh, of course, at the moment, there are no hyenas here, but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be hyenas a little bit later. The smell of a male lion will keep hyenas at bay. They'll be quite scared 
Now with lionesses, often it's quite different. They'll take a chance, but not with males. And I think the smell of adult male lions is all around here still. But the vultures have already eaten so much. Look at that. So there's a whole bunch of vultures just sitting on the termite mound next to us. And you can actually, if you look carefully, their crops are really, really full. Now, depending on what type of animal you are, it depends on how long you're going to be able to eat this kill for. And Kathy was wondering how long you're going to be able to eat uh, this kill, how long it'll remain. Poppy, sorry. Poppy, not Kathy. Uh, and you can see the crops are full. Patty, sorry about that, Patty. Now, you can see the crops are full. If you're a vulture, you're going to be able to eat this for the next three days. It is really, really, they can eat the most rotten, disgusting meat. They've got incredibly powerful bacteria and enzymes in their, in their, in their gut that enables, the, enables them to eat rotten meat. Now, a lion will also be able to eat this till it is for the next three or four days, even if it's hot and, and, and really, really disgusting. Uh, most animals out here will be able to eat it. The only predators that really don't eat rotting meat are wild dogs and cheetah. Leopard, lion will all eat really rotting meat and of course hyenas uh, as well. Of course they do prefer fresh meat, but if meat is meat and a predator must eat. And as you remember, we are in the eight and a half million acre massive wilderness area where the animals are able to live their lives protected and live as they have for many hundreds of thousands of years on the African savannah. Now those vultures are what we call white-backed vultures. Um, when they open up their wings they've got a wonderful white sort of landing stripe in the middle of their back but they are so full at the moment they can't even take another bite of a buffalo. And you can see even a vulture has to continuously preen its feathers. And it's very, very important for the vultures to preen their feathers because they are very heavy birds and they don't like flapping when they fly. So what they do is they try to catch the wind thermals, but to catch and ride those thermals with using the least amount of energy, they need to make sure all their feathers are in order. So they do spend a lot of time picking and preening at their feathers, making sure they're in immaculate condition. Now, isn't this incredible? There's so much out here in the African bush and we can't wait to show you even more, but I cannot keep you away from Jamie and those gorgeous leopards any longer. Gorgeous indeed, and I hear that Brent has potentially been turning some stomachs with his closer examination of that buffalo carcass. Well, I'm afraid we're moving from one carcass to another, and Shungile is having a marvelous time enjoying her breakfast. My name is Jamie, and you are on a live safari from the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa, where we're sitting with this amazing family of leopards. We've been waiting all morning to see the mother and daughter return to the sun and finally have a chance to finish off that impala that Karula managed to catch last yesterday evening. Look at her tucking in. Now, while we watch Shungile, the princess, enjoying her breakfast, Kelsey, lovely to hear from you. You want to know, does each leopard have a preferred type of prey? To a degree, yes, although they're opportunists and there are no rules out here. So if they see something that they want to hunt and they can hunt, they'll take that opportunity. Um, generally, you'll find that it is sort of determined by size of the leopard. So it's the, the, the prey that they can take, the largest prey that a Karula could take is usually something like this adult impala. However, there are leopards that do specialize. Tingana, for example, the father or potential father of Hosanna and Shungila and the dominant male leopard of this area, he apparently seems to have a f appetite for warthogs. Warthogs and art farks, so I've heard. And on multiple occasions, we've actually seen him go underground into warthog burrows and come out with warthog piglets. So that's one of his sort of preferred sources of prey. And you'll find that different leopards specialize in different things. But 
As I said, there are no rules out here, and these cats definitely don't read the textbooks, so they do what they want, and they are constantly surprising, even us, and we've spent years and years out here getting to know these, getting to know individual animals, and they still manage to surprise us on a constant basis. Shongile tucking in, using that carnassial shear at the back of her jaw, those incredibly sharp molar teeth to slice through. Now she's been eating meat since she was three months old. And I will never forget the first time I ever saw Shungile. It was the most extraordinary moment. We were sitting with Karula, who'd made an impala kill, just like this one. And the cubs must have been two months old at the time, so they'd just, just been introduced to meat. And we weren't sure, we, we thought they were there, but we weren't sure if we were going to see them. And we were just about to leave when Karula started giving that contact call that a female leopard gives, sort of a ow, ow call. And we sat quietly and we waited, and of course they were so shy when they were so small. And then out of the long grass came these tiny little, tiny little creatures, no, no longer than my forearm. And they, out they sort of slunk through the grass and went up to Karula, and then Shungile turned around and looked straight at me. And I'll never forget that moment with those gorgeous brown eyes of her. Uh, while Shungile tucks in, it sounds as though James is seeing some of their worst enemies. Their worst enemies, and they're just coming out of the tree. We heard one of the males going, Bahu! Bahu! There, you can hear them screaming now. Now, this is a troop of baboons. Dave, come over here. They're running on the ground here. This is a troop of baboons called the Juma Troop, and they've started to spend more and more time around us over here. There they are with some impala. Knocking about there. And they hang around with impala all the time. And we've been watching them with quite a lot of interest over the last week or so. So take a look at this clip of what they got up to just outside our back door. Now there they are. You can see them wandering across the landscape, picking up fruits and shoots. And they're really very human, you see. This toddler cannot but put everything it finds into its mouth. There it goes, running along, looking for fruits, and this one riding pinion as they travel to the next crop of shoots. And, well, you know, mum's got to socialise a bit, and little one finds that a bit boring from time to time. The troops hanging around with the impala herd because of the extra eyes and the ears that they offer in a constant search for danger, normally, as Jamie was saying, lions or leopards. Then the impala rams seem to be gearing up for the rut with some semi-playful horn-butting banter, but it's all just practice for later in the year, around about May. The main source of delight, of course, is the sweet vitamin C saturated marula fruits on the ground and in the trees. These ones are running away because Brian and I were walking towards them. Now, can you imagine, right under the tree, you've just seen them in, watching the sunset with a pile of sweet fruit and a date. That's the best possible way to while away an afternoon here in the Lowfeld. So that's this wonderful troop of baboons, and they are such amazing characters. We love spending time around them. Shane, you're wondering about the danger posed by baboons. Um, Shane, look... They're in, in parts of Africa where they've been fed by people, then they can become dangerous. Just about every single animal out here, of course, is threatened by human beings. And I never, I never ever term an animal dangerous. An animal is potentially dangerous. An animal becomes potentially dangerous when it feels threatened enough. It's exactly like you. So if you are cornered, for, perhaps, say you're cornered in a situation by things that threaten you, say you're cornered by criminals, you're eventually going to turn around and fight. And that is when an animal becomes dangerous when it is threatened and it feels like you are attacking it. And of course, because they see us as predators, then you can see how they would react like that if they feel cornered. So these baboons, not dangerous in the slightest. Let's head across to Steph, who's got the least dangerous thing in all the world. That is an understatement, if I've ever heard one. This fantastic-looking flower that you're having a look at over here is aptly named the Gloriosa Superba, the Superglory flower, or as we like to call it out here commonly, the flame lily. 
and is one of the most toxic plants that we have out here. This plant is so toxic, in fact, that I won't even touch it. Uh, I won't put it in my mouth, I won't rub it in my fingers, and I definitely won't pick the flower whatsoever. This plant has the ability of stopping your heart very, very quickly with the toxins that it contains in it. But, you know, You've seen quite a lot of things eating today and I just thought that with this toxic flower that looks so awesome, what could you or what could I show you that I found around this particular flower that you could put in your mouth? And I have a selection. This lovely blackjack doesn't look like you could eat it whatsoever. It definitely doesn't look as pretty as the flame lily does and yet its leaves are highly nutritious. You can pick its leaves just like this and pop them in your mouth and they are a very peppery rocket type flavor. Next is, oh, we are getting a little bit of picture breakup I'm told, it's just because we are right up close to this tree, don't go anywhere. That pretty flower, which is almost as pretty as the flame lily, is the blue carmelina and this you can also eat. It doesn't quite taste the same as the rocket, it's got a very sweet taste to it, it's because it's got a nice sap in it. This is the seed pod of a Cleome and if we open up the seed pod like that you'll see it's got some round seeds in it these seeds taste exactly the same as hot English mustard so I'm having a little bit of mustard on my breakfast of salad this morning and then just because no breakfast would be good without some oats of some sort this is the panicum maximum and these seeds contain a lot of very good yumminess, the same as what any of the grainy seeds that we have going. So a mustardy, oh, quite good. Yeah. Then so while I'm finishing my breakfast, you've asked what is the most noticeable plant in this particular area. This particular, oh, this particular um, bush that we have over here is basically dominated by three species of trees. I would say by marulas, by knob thorns, which are acacias, and then by um, combretums. So this is a combretum woodland with knob thorn and marula. That is how we describe this particular woodland where we live in at the moment. In actual fact, this tree that I'm sitting under, this is a combretum, one of the most common of the trees that we have around here. Mm. I must say that this mustardy oats, sweet peppery, breakfast that I'm busy having at the moment is um, turning into something quite nice. And then to end it off, I'm chewing on the roots of this Waltheria plant and this is a general tonic just to make you feel good in case I've swallowed something bad along the way. Quite medicinal. Alright, while I carry on chewing on my medicine root, um, why don't you go back to Brent with those awesome lions. Well, maybe I should get some of that medicine root after playing around near a, a semi-rotting buffalo carcass. As you can see, we're back with the wonderful Birmingham boys. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and you're on a live African safari. And, well, you can see there's two massive male lions weighing around 400 pounds just over my left shoulder. So there's another male lion lying behind us. As I said, I don't think they're going to get up to too much. But you never know, because it's live, you've got to come check it out. Another lion might wander in, a buffalo might wander in, they might get chased by an elephant. So it always pays to play the patience game out in the African bush. Now, while they're lying so close to us, it does give us a unique opportunity to have a look at their faces in quite some detail. And if we have a look at all the scars, so there's Tinior, the tooth, and you can actually see that wound where he's got the split lip that uh, gave him his name and that has taken a long time to heal and that quite often happens with lions because they are constantly in the wars and they are the biggest baddest guys in the area so if any other males happen to wander in they would see them off but they also spend a lot of time fighting amongst each other for the rights to mate with females. Now, you can see 
his nose. Now, there's a lot of different theories about how to age a lion, and when he's got a pink nose, he's supposed to be under six years old, and when he's got a fully black nose, he's supposed to be over. But in my experience, it all just depends on the lion. You can see he's got a dappled nose, and he's breathing quite heavily, and that's quite common if he's got a nice big belly full of buffalo as he's digesting. Now, as you can see, as he slumbers so effectively, uh, Victoria, who's 10 years old, welcome on the safari, Victoria, uh, is wondering, how long do you lie and sleep normally? Now, Victoria, on average, they probably sleep for about 20 hours a day. So if you like napping, uh, you definitely want to be a lion. Now, the reason they sleep for so long is that they do have trouble getting rid of heat. Uh, and that's also why they're mostly nocturnal and they move around when it's cool and in the night and the early morning and late afternoon. And when they've got a full belly, they can sleep for even longer. Now, even though this lion is fast asleep and not moving, if there's a sound uh, or if a rival male lion called to the north of us, these three boys would be up in a flash and could probably cover 10 to 15 miles in, in, in less than an hour. So they can move very quickly when they need to, especially when their territory is being threatened by a marauding male. Now, there are other males that surround them, but at the moment, no one would dare challenge the four Birmingham boys. Uh, they are really, really well set as sort of the kings uh, are of this part of the world at the moment. Now, the incredible thing is we've been watching these lions oof, for over two years now. Oh, you can see there's a nice scratch scar in the middle of his back. So, male lions are always full of scars. And not too far from where we're sitting, actually almost exactly where Jamie is sitting with those leopards, about, I think it was October 2015, is, is where they really made their play to take over. There were two big males here called the Matimba males, and those boys used to dominate over the prides in this area. And then these five rapscallions, these youngsters came in and initially they sort of sneak around, but eventually they started roaring and stating their presence. It took about a month and a half of two months for them to actually truly push the older males out of the area and take over. And it's a really, really difficult time for lion dynamics in the area because these guys will often kill cubs, kill lionesses, they're fighting with males, their testosterone's up. Uh, but it is, it's a fascinating thing to watch and we, we were lucky enough to witness quite a few interactions between them. And as I said, exactly where Jamie is with those leopards uh, was the first time, I think you were with me, Brian, that we actually saw them fight and chase each other up and down. Now, speaking about where the lions were fighting and roaring and chasing each other up and down, let's go back there, but there are no lions there, only leopards. And a big cat-themed morning indeed that we are having here in the middle of the Greater Kruger National Park on your live safari. Now, if you have just jumped on board with us, my name is Jamie, and this morning, Viam is on camera with me. He's the one bringing you these incredible images, and we are sitting with the royal family of Juma, Queen Karula, and her two offspring enjoying a delicious breakfast of deceased impala. We've been watching Shungile as she tucks into her breakfast and I have to tell you that she, while I've been watching her, she has let out two very unladylike belches while we've been watching her. Uh, some would perhaps a better teach her to eat like a lady. Not, of course, that leopards need to. Now, for those of you that are just joining us, these animals are completely 100% wild. Karula caught and killed that impala last night, and we are incredibly fortunate to be able to have the privilege to share these lives with them. Now, Alexandria, lovely to have you on board, Alexandria. Oh, hello, girl. Oh, I've just got the smell of deceased impala wafting over us. Thanks, Shungile. <laughs> Sorry, Alexandria. You wanted to know... <laughs> that's quite pungent. You wanted to know um, how long a leopard can go without eating. And the answer is probably a week or two, uh, uh, maybe two weeks, possibly even a little bit longer. But of course, the weaker they get out here in the wild, they, they don't get fed. So they have to have the strength to be able to catch and hunt their own food. And generally speaking, though, leopards are incredibly good at that. Um, even when there isn't something for them to catch or they don't have the strength to catch something big, uh, 
two weeks ago, we watched a little leopard cub eat a tortoise, which any leopard could catch. So they are true opportunists. And just to give you an idea of what kind of opportunists they are, one of my most extraordinary sightings to date, and it's also a testament to Karula's skill as a mother, one of the most extraordinary sightings I've had of all three of these leopards to date was with them in a very dense riverbed, and Karula had caught an antelope, and she had it in a tree, which of course leopards often do in order to keep their kills stashed away. And while we were sitting there, out of nowhere, a pack of three wild dog came barreling into the sighting, caught a baby in Yala, and ate it in front of Karula and her cubs, all of whom were up the tree, safe and out of harm's way. And once the wild dogs had left, when they realized that they couldn't get to the leopards that were up the tree, Karula dashed down, and grabbed the leftovers, because wild dogs don't always consume everything that they catch and that they eat. And she went down, got the leftovers, and trotted back and put it back in the tree next to her original kill. And that story tells us a few things. First of all, it goes to show what opportunists they are. Second of all, it goes to show that on these live safaris, you just never know what to expect. And I wish you could have seen Karula's expression. She looked like a shopper that <laughs> has got the best bargain ever. She's just popped down out of the tree. I wonder where she's going to go. Perhaps she might want to come and enjoy some breakfast as well. Nope, just finding a more comfortable spot. Now, don't forget that because this is all happening live, it means that you can send through your questions as well, and you can do that using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, please do let us know. If you want to know anything about the royal family, leopards in general, or in fact the African bush in general, you can send your questions through on Twitter in that way. Oh, exhausted. Uh, while we wait for Shungile to finish off her breakfast, I'm thinking about going off in search of her brother, who has vanished. Uh, as you saw last week, the two of them get up to inordinate amounts of mischief. Oh, hold on, she might actually leave her breakfast. Now, while she has a jolly good scratch and decides whether or not she is still famished, I'm sure you're all dying to know the answer to the two truths and one lie, so I think it's time that James told you. We're back outside the tent, everybody, and the baboons are still knocking about in the tree there, chasing each other up and down, hither and yon, willy-nilly, and I'm sure you're all desperately trying to find out who and how many got two truths and one lie correct. Next week I'm going to have to do a lot better than I managed this year, at least this week. 75% uh, of you got it correct. Uh, scorpions are not, in fact, attracted to the smell of coffee. Now, if you have just joined us, my name is James Hendry, and it's wonderful to have you with us on this live safari, the fourth of eight of them. Hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us, and ask us questions, send us your comments, and thank you to all of you who have done that already. Just quickly, it is interesting, the thing that people fear the most out here is snakes. And more people are struck by lightning in Africa than they are bitten by snakes, quite, or that are, than are killed by snakes. So that's quite an interesting one. You know, the chances of being struck by lightning are extremely small. Now, I just wanted to quickly look over here because I thought I saw a hovering fly but it seems to have hovered off. While we do that, let's have a look at where we are in the world. You can see us zooming in on Africa, on the northeast corner of the South Africa, which is the world's most beautiful country, of course. And there is Juma, the part of the Western Kruger that we are very privileged to call home. And it's on Juma that most of the action's taking place here, with those leopards, with those lions, with that dead buffalo. And Steph, with the Gloriosa sapoba, which of course was in fact a deeply toxic plant. I didn't realize he was looking at that particular flower. Let's head across to Steph now and find out what he's going to show you next. We are, we are in South Africa, as you might have been told by my colleagues already. And South Africa is a very resource poor country in terms of water. And so water out here in the bush is in particular demand by everything. And so you've got to make use of whatever you can find. Now I'm expecting to find some water in this area. We're starting to get some plants that are showing us that there's water. As you can see from the very lush vegetation around us, this thick, thick, thick panicum, that is a sign of water. We're starting to get these terminalia trees 
trees as well, these silver cluster leaf trees, they are also a sign that hopefully there's a wallow somewhere close by or at least a puddle. Now what I'm hoping to do when you come back to me next time is show you what I'm going to do with some charcoal I collected from a stump that we passed a little bit earlier. So here we go, there's some charcoal that I picked off of a tree, excuse the leaves that I've got with it, that is for I'm trying to dry them <laughs> for some snuff. Now, see if you can think what I'm going to be doing with this charcoal, not the snuff, with the charcoal in this area where I'm expecting to find some water. So we are interactive. You're welcome to ask me some question, and you can send through to or you send through whatever you think we're going to do with this charcoal to the hashtag Safari Live. When we see you me next, I'll have something prepared for you. In the meantime, you're off to Brent. He's got a bird. Look at this. So while the lions were sleeping, we decided to show you some of the other exquisite wildlife that lives in our home. And this is called a little bee eater. Oh, he's going to come back, land. Yes. Did he catch something? No. So they actually specialize in hunting wasps and bees with terrible stings. And what they do, oh, is he going to come back? No, not this time. They often land exactly in the same perch. And so what they do is when they actually catch something that's got a sting, he'll beat it against the branch with his beak and actually remove the stinger. And that's how they got their names, bee eaters. But they are exquisitely beautiful. We've got quite a few different species. This is the smallest of them. And they are literally flying all around us at the moment. Oh, there's one beating a, beating a stinging insect. Let me just go forward a tiny bit. Now remember this is live and birds are incredibly difficult. So Brian is doing a fantastic job. There he is. Hello, little one. Oh, he's already swallowed whatever he was beating on his branch. There's another one there. And look how busy they are. Look how their eyes are constantly searching for any flying insect to devour. Oh, and another one flew through. Oh, off they go. Now, one of the, the nicest things is they live in little, little flocks. Oh, off he goes. Are you going to come back? <laughs> Not this time. Uh, they're keeping us keeping us honest here. Now, we get about 350 different species of birds from the tiniest uh, little brown indes indescribable musk. We call them LBJs, little brown jobs, and they're very difficult to, to, to identify, to these exquisitely beautiful birds like bee eaters. We've also got lots of predator, predatory birds, and it's an amazing how many different animal species actually live uh, in this area. Oh, oh no, yes, there they are again, they're back. Oh, he's beating, did he swallow it already? Oh, he's too quick for us today. <laughs> and back again. He didn't catch something that time. Oh, he did, there we go, see how he's beating it against the, the, the stick? And, doop, off we go. They are absolutely exquisite little creatures. Okay, now, when listening carefully, there's a lot of different bird species around us, and we're going to try to find you some more. Hopefully we can find you some planes game, zebra, impala, and then we'll go back to those lines a little bit later. But again, who am I to keep you away from the most gorgeous cat in the African bush, the leopard with Jamie? undoubtedly the most gorgeous cat that we get out here and I have a feeling that Hosanna when he grows up is going to be a truly good-looking male indeed in the same way that all of Karula's male offspring have been there she produces truly beautiful male leopards so we have managed to find Hosanna once again on our live safari admittedly it would have been hard to miss him he's now much more out in the open but still on the most uncomfortable looking branch he could possibly have chosen and I just don't know what got into him today. Typically when we see all three of them together, especially with food, Hassan is the first one in there snacking away, crunching away, eating as much as he can. I wonder what's up with him. Now he's all on his own, away from the rest of them, having a little bit of a tantrum maybe. <laughs> Look at them. 
And while we look at this gorgeous face, Ginger, thank you for sending through your question. You wanted to know whether or not, or how often, leopards break teeth and if it affects them at all. Uh, they do break teeth, uh, obviously, as they get older as well. It's just more years of wear and tear. And Karula's actually lost the tip off one of her canines. If we have a chance to have a look in the, ne in the next few minutes, perhaps we'll go and have a look and see if she gives us a yawn. You'll be able to see she has a broken canine. But for the most part, it doesn't affect them too negatively. They, of course, have many teeth. I think it's 30, to be exact. Oh, there we go. He gave us a perfect demonstration of his gorgeous, sharp canines, all clean and white because he's only just started to grow them. Hey, boy. <laughs> we actually saw the cubs grow their teeth. Um, so in terms of how often it affects them, not all that often, but you're, it's very common to find older leopards with broken teeth. Oh, here we go. It's a time for the graceful dismount. We know how well Hosanna does those, don't we? From seeing him play around yesterday, or last week with Brent. Hold on a moment. I'm just going to roll forward ever so slightly. Oh, dear. We appear to have a slight vehicle problem. <laughs> oh, we're going to be taking a short break while we sort out our vehicle. And don't go anywhere. We'll catch up with you soon. A dreadful pity, and I'll tell you a story that that I nearly swore car has done that to me before in a leopard sighting with those three leopards and a vehicle full of guests before. Anyway, don't worry, it will be sorted out and it will not in any shape, way or form chase those leopards away. It's happened to me before. I don't know why it happens. Anyway, uh, don't worry. It did chase the guests away, which I suppose could have been thought of as a positive. Here, while we wait for Jamie to sort out her vehicle issues, is the lava of a monarch butterfly. Now, many of you have heard of the monarch butterfly in North America, and it's got a most magnificent story. And I think it's the most romantic story in all the insect world. What happens is that in North America, they breed up in Canada, and then they fly clean across the continental United States into Mexico. And you know, no butterfly that takes off in Canada ever actually makes it to Mexico. Let me say that again. No butterfly that takes off in Canada makes it to Mexico. They breed on the way. And so the butterflies arriving in Mexico are the grandchildren of the ones that left. Isn't that amazing? So no butterfly ever makes that astonishing migration of insects across the continental United States. Now, these ones do not, in fact, migrate. It will look very similar to a North American monarch butterfly when it pupates. And these warning colors, much like that gloriosa superba that Steph would look, was looking at, tell birds and us that this is not for eating. Now, if you were in any doubt, all you would have to do is to look at the plant that it's eating. Now, I have, it's not actually growing in here. I put it in here. Uh, it, I found it just next to the tent, but it's quite nice hanging here. And you can see little bits of white. And that white stuff is milky latex. Well, the disgusting milky latex, it's highly, highly toxic. And that's the story of the monarch butterfly there. Okay, let's go back into the tent. I think we've still got communications with the final control, do we? Oh. We have two minutes, I think, to an advert break, is that correct? Ah, sorry, we have two minutes to TV. I missed that entirely. Uh, I think it was during the beeping situation. Anyway, uh, good. Right, we've got two minutes of TV. I still, uh, there's a wonderful story, regardless. Whew. Huh. Okay. Now, we just need to set up our little tadpole thing here. Now, for those of you who have seen this before, what we're going to do is do some tadpoles. And also a drone shot over Chitwa Dam, which is going to be quite fun. But what I need to do, I'll tell you what I'm doing, is I'm just emptying out some water here because the tadpole is a very accomplished swimmer. And so we just want him to be in enough water that he can breathe, and then, but not enough that he can swim away. So I'm going to put him back in this jar. And there he is. He's in just a tiny little pop of water. I'm not sure if you can ever have a pop of water, actually. 
And we'll just stick this back in here. And there we are. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, he's in perfect state now, and I can just see his little leg buds starting. Right, you'll have to uh, hold on for what's going to happen next. We'll keep him in there, and then I will release him. And we're going to go black screen, I think. Oh. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back, welcome back everybody to your live safari on the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. I must just quickly apologize for that beeping noise. I had a wonderful time with those three leopards one time before in that beastly vehicle, which is now going to be thoroughly thrashed when it gets home. And it did exactly the same thing. And astoundingly, those leopards just looked up like this, went, eh and carried on with what they were doing. That was about three months ago, so they were very young still, the little cubs. Didn't affect them at all. So please don't worry, they haven't been chased away. The amusing part of what did happen in that sighting that I was in, of course, was that there was a vehicle full of guests next door who just couldn't really understand why I was hooting at the leopards, and they left shortly thereafter. Anyway, all is fine, and we will go and see those leopards shortly. Hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us on Twitter. Send us your questions or comments. Perhaps you have some advice, mechanical advice on how to stop a beeping car. That would be great. Now, we're going to take to the air above the water. There we are. We are now hanging above a green verdant landscape and shortly we are going to explode over one of the greatest water bodies of the Sabi sand. Here it comes. Oh, dear. No, no, bit of a break up there, never mind. Anyway, we we're going to try and show you some hippos. We will still try and do that. Now, in fact, it's back up. Let's go and have a look. There it is, gorgeous water hole here called Chitwa Dam. And there's some hippos there. It's a huge pod of hippos, probably about 30 of them living in this dam. But the main thing that I am so excited to show you there, you can see Drone Commander Connor Teagues sitting there on the dam wall. I'm going to ask him to fly now due south towards that stick sticking out of the dam. And in the middle of it, a whole lot of smaller sticks. And that's the nest of the red-billed buffalo weaver. And on top of the red-billed buffalo weaver, there's something else. So, Connor, just get in on top of that as close as you can, and we'll have a look into the top of that thing. What do you think it could be, everyone? Look, you can see little specks of white, and quite astoundingly, as we discovered a few days ago, there are the eggs of the Egyptian goose. Twelve eggs in all. And it's the most brilliant nest site for an Egyptian goose because no snake can get up there, no crocodile will climb up there. I suppose a water monitor lizard, which you saw in that highlight clip with Hosanna, could get up there, but otherwise that thing is predator safe. Here you can see the red-billed buffalo weavers going into their enormous apartment block. That's basically what they've got there. And then you can just see a little bit of sort of yellow-colored nesting on the left-hand side, and those are the nests of the village weavers. So we've got village weavers, red-billed buffalo weavers, and on the very top, in the penthouse suite, we have the Egyptian goose, and soon, hopefully, 12 goslings. Isn't that wonderful? Now, this is the Chitwa Dam, and the Chitwa pod of hippos has been providing us with an enormous amount of entertainment. So I'm going to ask Connor to zoom out a little bit and see if he can't find the pod. I think it was just behind where you are now, Connor. So if you keep swinging to the left, there we are. Keep going. There's one hippo, and I think just a little bit further to the left, we'll find the rest of them. There are two of them now watching Drone Commander Teagues. 
as he flies over there, the rest of them are there on the right-hand side. So what that will be is the main pod with the big bull, some cows, and some little ones. And then the others dotted about the place will be young bulls, juveniles, and sub-adults sort of finding their way in the hippo world. And I'm kind of hoping that we'll be able to see some Egyptian geese. But I don't see an Egyptian goose. Look at that, everyone. Down, Connor, just go to the right, go to the right. There is a fish eagle. There it is, right in the middle of your screen there, Connor. Well done. There's a fish eagle. That is Chitwa Lodge, everyone. And that fish eagle, everybody, for in North America is the wonderful bird for you, of course, because it is the same genus as your bald eagle and looks very similar, not quite the same size, but it is a very closely related bird. Isn't that beautiful? And what it will do will go and take fish out of the dam, but also they will eat little baby goslings if they can get hold of them. And so the adult geese will be very weary of him. This is a beautiful shot. Oh, that's wonderful. And <laughs> oh, very perfect to have seen the fish eagle void his bowels as we left. Excellent. OK, Steph is now going to show you something about how you survive in the bush with water. Now, we haven't the same sized body of water as you were with, but we've got ourselves a little puddle. We finally managed to find ourselves one of those bush felt pans that I was talking about. This is a wallow that is probably being created by rhinoceros and buffalo and warthog. And this is generally how you find your water in this particular area. Now, you might notice that I'm a bit dirty and it's because I've been uh, wading around in here and also building something for you. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how you can utilize this water from a survival point of view. Obviously, you'd like to boil water if you can, but it's not always possible. Sometimes the wood is just too wet or you just don't have the means to make a fire. But quite often, there's the means to make a water filter. And that is what I'm gonna do for you right now. So, I've picked, I have some of that charcoal. As you can see, my hands are black. I picked that off of a tree that had burnt during a fire recently. So there's some charcoal. I've also picked some flavorant because to be quite honestly, the, uh, this water is not gonna taste nice no matter what I do to it. So I'm flavoring it with a little bit of basil. Now Xavier, um, you've asked what I was, well I asked the question, what are we gonna do with this charcoal? And I'm gonna use it in my filter. I'm not gonna brush my teeth with it. Yes, you can brush your teeth with charcoal because the ash from charcoal is quite abrasive and you can use it to brush your teeth with. Um, so you can, you're not wrong Xavier, it's just a question of what I'm gonna do with it right now in terms of water. So I've picked a little bit of this osamum that I'm gonna flavor my water with because it's not gonna be nice what I'm gonna do now. I have then my other sock in my hand and I'm going to use this as, as a receptacle for collecting this water. The freshest water here is going to be the water that lies closest to the surface. So what you want to try and do is use something that's absorbent. You can see how that's, my sock is absorbing the water there just as close to the surface as what I can get it. I'm going to roll it around inside there making sure I saturate it, but without disturbing. Oh, there we go. You can see I've got a little bit of mud on the bottom over there. So we won't use that part. And then I've made a filter for you. So keep it in a hand. What I've done, let's put my flavorant in the top there, is I've used my other sock. I've filled the bottom with a mixture of sand, which gives it some weight. There's some sand inside there. The charcoal, I made a nice thick layer, and then some grass at the top and then my flavorant, my osmum. And I've found a snail shell as a receptacle as well. So this is a snail shell from a giant land snail that we found lying out here in the bush. That's gonna catch my water for me. So put that down, I've got myself a stand. So there we go. Making sure that the heaviest part is at the bottom. All right, so now all you basically do is you squeeze your water out of your sock. I'm gonna to have to fetch some more. All right, now, 
I'm getting told that Scott and Megan, hello, you've managed to guess that I'm going to purify water with that charcoal. So well done there on guessing that. As you can see, the water that's going in here is not, there's our starting to come out the bottom. Now what I'm hoping is that the charcoal has absorbed any of the potential bad things in the water. Activated charcoal is good for toxins out here. The grass would have taken care of any mud or leftover mud that I have inside here. And the sand would have filtered out any of the fine particulates, the fine pieces of clay. So you can see that you can do this and get a fair amount of water through there. Now obviously the best is to boil it as well, but since I don't have a fire, you know, bottoms up. Um, it's a bit charcoaly, it tastes a little bit like sand. But I've got no crunch in my teeth, so we managed at least to get all the sand out of that. All right, and on that note, we're going to send you over to Brent with a buffalo. Oh, look at this. It's a big buffalo bull. They are really, really nervous, and I'm pretty sure this group of buffalo is the exact group that that dead buffalo we saw earlier came from. So there's only about five or six of them and they're called what we call dugger boys or old bulls. And these guys are particularly nervous. He He's staring down his nose at us. He's not looking very comfortable. That's why I haven't gone too close. And uh, there's an old saying, an old adage in the African bush that a buffalo always looks at you like you owe him money. And this is one of the most dangerous animals in the African bush if you're on foot. And especially if you're moving around pans like Steph is, he's always got to keep a sharp eye out for the African buffalo. They like to wallow in the pans. And here's another one coming to, look, there we go. There's that down the nose stare. Now these are, are big bulls. There's one young cow, or oldish cow in this group as well. And I think she's joined up with them because they were chased by the lions and there's some form of safety in numbers. Now we're not gonna go any closer. He's, he's, these buffalo are really not relaxed at all. And I think it's because, as I said, the lions caught one of them yesterday. So they are massive animals. A big bull like that will be about 2,000 pounds. And you can see how nervous he is, moving his head, sniffing around, keeping an eye on us, but he's about to disappear into some thickets. And there's, you can, oh, there we go, he's still checking on us. He just flipped his head back to look at us. There he is. Hello, old man. And Heather's wondering how fast can a buffalo run? Well, Heather, the most important fact is that it can run faster than a human being. A buffalo is faster than the fastest man alive, Usain Bolt. And uh, they can do up to about 50 kilometers an hour, uh, maybe 55 at a push. So faster than the fastest human. Now, they are one of the ones you've really got to look for when you're walking in the bush. And the other thing is these old boys, uh, they're about between 12 and 15 years old. They've moved out of the breeding herds and uh, they often sleep very soundly. So you've got to be very careful you don't disturb them when you're walking on foot. That's why you've got to pay attention to all your senses, your eyes, your ears, even your nose. And of course, the most important, your ears. Again, your ears. But anyway, back to Jamie and those incredible cats. Speaking of having ears and listening out in the bush, of course, if you ever needed any proof that this was a live safari, well, I think we provided it in the most spectacular of fashions. Uh, the last time you saw me, it was just before we went into the ad break, and the car decided um, out of nowhere to decide to start making a noise for no apparent reason. And I'm sure when we get back to camp after I've set the car alight, we're all going to have a jolly good laugh at that. But what it does go to show is that just how incredibly privileged we are to have garnered the trust of these special animals because none of them have moved. I mean, if you thought the expression on my face was incredulous, you should have seen Hosanna looking at me. But there you go, proof that this is a completely live and sometimes unexpected things happen, but the animals trust us completely. There you can see little Shungile not at all bothered. And so, 
with that special thought in mind and the fact that we are so privileged to have this insight into their amazing lives, I'd love to hear from you in just one word how it is that this particular sighting with these leopards has made you feel. It's the first time on our live safari experience that we've seen all three of them together, giving a very, very strong sense of family and, of course, that incredible connection that Karula has with her cubs. Now, please send that through, one word, on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and my word is going to be privileged. I was going to ask you to send through one word tweet on the embarrassment of the vehicle making a very loud and a very unexpected noise but I think really the beauty of the sighting should really take precedence. Don't you agree Shungile? In, in South Africa we have an expression stomach full eyes closed. And that is exactly what's happened with the little princess. She's gorged herself on her impala breakfast, and now she is fast asleep and snoozing in the tree. And how fortunate we are to spend the time that we do get to with these incredible creatures. Right, now, I'm not going to enter the next ad break in the spectacular fashion that I did the last one, but please don't go anywhere. As you saw, it is live, and absolutely anything can occur. We'll see you soon. All right, little Shungile. Sorry about that. I think the worst that we did was just disturb her nap ever so slightly while she was snoozing away in the weeping waffle. And Karula, believe it or not, is here. I don't know if we've even had a chance to show you that. She's there. Um, she was there. That grass moving there, that's a, that's a foot? Pale? Body part of leopard? Not entirely sure which part of her it is, but that is where Karula is hiding, at the base of the weeping wattle. Where are you off to? Are you thinking about more breakfast, or are you thinking about a comfier spot? Now with that round belly, it must be harder to find a comfortable patch of tree. I think she's going to go down towards Karula. And Hassan is still having a sulk in his tree off in the distance. Not sure what his problem is. He hasn't, didn't even move, you know. It was incredible. All that noise, and he just looked at me like, what is that stupid human doing this time? Rubbing herself up against the leaves, enjoying a good scratch. Fortunately, I figure by the end of this film, we'll be inured to embarrassment, pretty much. We'll be immune to it. <laughs> What's there? Does something smell nice, or is it just a good place to scratch? Can't believe how her eyes have changed color. A little bit sad about that. I was sort of hoping that they would stay that amazing hazel brown that they were when she was a cub. But they've gone much more sort of the color of her mom and her brother's eyes now. It was unique. I've never seen eyes like that on a leopard. <laughs> what was the, you're catching flies now. No, a stick. Yes, well done. You caught the stick. Oh, you dropped the stick. Oh dear. Don't worry. There's plenty of other sticks. That was a thud. It was unexpected. Ah, the perfect patch of comfortable grass. <laughs> ah, there we go. The tip of Karula's tail just sticking up above the long. Isn't it incredible how much the grass has grown over the last few weeks since we've had the rain? It's phenomenal. It is such a change in the environment that we're in. Right, now all leopards have vanished, and I can't really move because Shungile has now plonked herself right next to me. I wonder how many times 
in our collective careers, we have driven past a leopard hidden like this. I would hazard a guess at several hundred. Hidden in the grass. There's no way you'd spot that. Driving along. Not a chance. I think that's her face. I think I see a whisker. Yes, I see whiskers. Ah, oh, Shungile. Come and park yourself right next to the vehicle. Didn't you learn from the last time? <laughs> the last experience. I don't think she's going to stay in there for long. She looks so comfortable and soft. Okay, Shungi. You are really in a very awkward place. <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh well, we'll just have to sit it out. Hopefully she decides that she wants more breakfast or something. Oh wait, hold on, Hosanna is thinking about coming down. Or he's about to fall out of the tree. And we just, just hidden. There's just a foot. <laughs> Here we go. He's just finding himself a more comfortable spot. Hold on, Beam. And welcome back to all of you rejoining us as part of our television audience here on your live safari. Uh, my name is Jamie, and if you have just joined us, we are coming to you live from a place called the Greater Kruger National Park, which is in the top northeastern corner of South Africa. And more specifically, we're on a reserve called Juma, where VM and myself have just spent the morning with the incredible family, or the royal family, of three leopards, Karula and her two cubs, Hosanna and Shungile, who you've had a chance to get to know over the last four weeks, and you will continue to have a chance to get to know over the course of the next the series of our safaris. Now, Shungile has as, as always happens with live wildlife filming, Shungile has decided that that is where she wants to be, right next to the vehicle. Now, before the break, I asked you for a one word to describe this particular leopard sighting and whether or not you had enjoyed it or what you felt really summed up the emotion of a moment like this. And Nina, you say spectacular. Thank you, Nina, for sending that through. It is spectacular. And it's a really lovely opportunity to see the bonds between the three of them, although they're quite spread out at the moment. I think that's just because they've been really enjoying the meal that they've had in their full bellies for once. And if you would like to send through another one word, you can do that, or you can send through any questions that you might have. Like, for example, what on earth am I going to do with a leopard cub right next to me? Because I definitely can't move. You can send through those questions, and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. <laughs> just see the back of her... Oh, you could just see the back of her head. What are you doing? She's chasing flies, you know. They're bugging her. That's what she's snapping at, and glancing around. And this is the joy of young leopard cubs, is they have a constant sort of fascination with the world around them. And the older leopards are generally, they've seen it all, and they're comfortable. Now, Logan, you wanted to know whether or not the leopard cubs are born with spots. And the answer is, oh, Chunkile, <laughs> you're all over the place at the moment. Yes, gorgeous. <laughs> the answer is yes, they are. We, we were very fortunate in that, well, Brent was very fortunate, in that he actually saw... Hello, girl. Oh, that was a very big belch. <laughs> oh, and another one. <laughs> You're making lots of noise. Did you eat your breakfast too quickly? Oh, and another one. No, little girl. Right, now that Shungil has given us a demonstration of her amazing gastric prowess, <laughs> we were talking about leopard spots. 
Uh, Brent actually saw these leopards when they were just a few hours old, which does go a long way to explaining why the Safari Live team is as attached to them as we are. But yes, they do have spots. They're unbelievably fluffy and absolutely gorgeous and really utterly adorable. So while Shungile digests her meal, hopefully without any more explosions emanating forth, I think it's time to go and have a look at something else quite tiny with James in the tent. It's so tiny, it's so tiny, and it's not going to belch. Blech. My name is James Hendry, and underneath the microscope we have got a very special little creature. That's a tadpole. Now, Steph was drinking water. He may well have consumed one of these if he hadn't poured the water through his sock. And the tadpoles are out in many, many of our little pans and water holes. Now, I'm going to keep this and tadpole and all his friends for the next four weeks to see how they develop. Now, if you look very carefully, I'm just gonna give him a bit of a shake. You can see the leg bud beginning on the top sort of surface that you can see there. You can see the leg bud between the tail and the body. You can see the first frog's leg starting to form there. Now, I don't know what species of frog this is, and I'm hoping over the next four weeks, if we keep them alive, they will turn into the frogs that we, well, that we will then enjoy and, and discover things about. No idea what tadpole that is. Good. Now, from a one water-themed sighting to another. Uh, Ronald the Rover has been waiting very patiently to show you himself to you. There is his view of a water hole. You can see he has been visited by some Egyptian geese today, and we're just going to move him down towards the water. It's a big, steep drop. Whoa, there he goes. Oh, oh onto the top top of the rock there, and we're just going to let him have a look and see if he can't find some terrapin friends under the rock there. There are lots of terrapins in the water and obviously many kinds of uh, frogs. And there he is on the dam cam. Oh, he's got one friend there, a blacksmith lapwing. That's very nice. Good. Well, Ronald's had a quite quiet day, but you know, he's a patient fellow. And so with any luck, uh, he will stay there. Now, um, if I was going to have something to drink, I might take this water and filter it through my sock. I'm not going to do that because that would be disgusting. Instead, while I tell you that the next show you're going to watch is called The Desert Sea, and it's a wonderful show about the Pacific West, uh, well, the Western Ocean, and of course the Sonoran Desert and its incredible creatures, and you can watch it there on Nat Geo Wild. It's coming up shortly. It's called the Desert Sea, and it's an encore uh, broadcast. And while I do that, I'm rather going to, rather than drinking that disgusting water, I'm going to hand one of these to David, the cameraman. Well done, David. Fine malt whiskey. We bid you a fond adieu for this week. 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next week. We will see you over here for a live safari. And in the meantime, while I consume this delicious stuff, we're going to hand you over to Steph and a dung beetle. Bottoms up. Look at what we've, uh, oh, cheers to that first, James. Thank you very much. <laughs> Secondly, look what we've got playing around in the road over here with their little ball. This is a dung beetle pair. This is the female. This is the male. Let me turn him so you can see him. He's doing all the work. He's pushing the dung ball down the road. That's the female. Her job is to pat the dung ball tight and to ward off any intruders that would like to come and steal the ball. They are rolling it down this pathway over here, specifically so that they can find a place to bury the dung. Once they've buried the dung, she will lay an egg on the dung, it will, it will hatch and the larvae will eat the dung ball, emerging as a fully formed dung beetle, probably about a season from now. But just have a look at the size of that dung beetle. This dung beetle, one of the strongest organisms on the planet, can push and lift up over a thousand times their own body weight. Now just to put that into perspective, um, a bull elephant can lift probably about 1.2 times its own body weight. A human can barely lift three times their own body weight. This little dung beetle can lift and push more than a thousand times their own body weight. Isn't that incredible? Very, very awesome. And that sort of brings us to the end of our bushwalk for this particular show. Don't forget, we've got another four more left, four more bushwalks here in the middle of the Kruger National Park. I'm looking forward to seeing you at every one of those. All right, until next time, bye-bye. 
Well, we got back to the lions after our meandering, and Mr. Tinho has is looking very uncomfortable as the African day heats up. Now, his other two coalition members have moved into a thicket, and I'm hoping he's going to do the same. Now, we've had so many questions, so many tweets. It's been absolutely incredible being able to interact with you. So we're going to try to do a, a little quick-fire round of lots of questions. Now, there we go. Zachary is wondering, how big is a lion's territory? Now, Zachary, it all depends on the size of uh, the coalition. A coalition of four males like this, they have a territory of about 20,000 hectares, oh, 20,000 acres, about 10,000 hectares. And there we go. And I was really hoping today that these boys would give us a roaring start or even hopefully a roaring send-off but unfortunately they haven't and Dara is wondering how many miles uh, does a lion's roar carry uh, for the human ear you can hear it for about six seven miles but if you're a lion you can probably hear it at over 10 miles 10 to 15 miles and it is incredible how that deep rumble rolls through the African bush and uh, I'm going to give you a little rendition of that a little later Now, being a group of males, it's, it's, it's always very interesting because uh, there's social dynamics. And Sid's wondering, is there a hierarchy amongst the males? In a deed, there is, Sid, but it is a, not a constant hierarchy. It changes. So depending on who's eaten the best, who's been in the fight the most recent. But normally, uh, from our interactions and what we've seen, Mfumo, who's named the authority, seems to be the most dominant out of these four lions. But as I said, he might get an injured foot. So Tinyo, the tooth, who we're looking at now, he might become dominant for a while, and so might Nena and Ntsuku. So it's a constant rolling change of, of hierarchy uh, and social standing. Oh, he's looking so uncomfortable. And look at that, he's giving himself a little bit of a clean. Lions are quite uh, filthy creatures. Now, Daisy's wondering, if the male lions have a dominant male, uh, do the lionesses also have a dominant female? Uh, not really. So with lionesses, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, there seems to be far more of a, a democratic society amongst the ladies. And uh, generally, again, with the dominance, it, it depends on who's the most hungry. Then you see who's the most aggressive around a kill or carcass. But it, it, it completely depends. But there's no real standout dominant female when it comes uh, to the, the ladies. Whereas with the males, there's always one who's dominant, but it, it's always changing. Oh, look at him. He's so hot now. The sun's just burst through the clouds. And it's probably about 80... 85 already and it's not even 8 a.m. in the morning here in Africa and uh, well I've loved answering all your questions but we've got one last one about the lions from Anna who's 13 years old wonderful to have you with us Anna Anna wants to know why does a male lion have that massive mane now Anna as I said, it's tough at the top for a male lion. They're constantly fighting, not only amongst each other, but to defend against lions from neighboring areas that might want to try to take their ladies, take their territory. So that big mane serves a couple of purposes. So the bigger the mane, the more impressive the male, the more scary he looks. So sometimes male lions will rely on intimidation, roaring and the size of their manes to see off an intruder. But if it does get serious and they do need to get into a fight, the big thick hair around their neck provides some really nice protection, uh, especially for their throat. And so it's, it's a really good protective layer if they do get into a fight, because when male lions fight, they attack each other head on and their instinct is to go for the throat, to get that kill or for the bait back of the head and at the back of the neck and, and head which is another vulnerable area. Now thanks very much for your questions. Oh Mr. Tinio is looking tired and I did say I was going to give you a quick rendition of a male lion's roar but I'm going to say it uh, as we say a goodbye from the killer bees and uh, we are going to go across to Jamie shortly but as we do that we're going to do what a lion does. So we're going to say Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.
and join us next week, Sunday, for your next dose of live African wildlife. Without further ado, over to the leopards. <laughs> I hear that Brent has been entertaining you with his lion rendition. I'm afraid I'm not going to even attempt doing that. I've often been told I am the worst imitator of lions that anybody has ever heard. So I'm definitely not going to be following suit. But it seems as though our sleepy lions, our leopards, are also sleepy. As the morning here in South Africa starts to heat up, we are getting warmer and warmer and the big cats have decided it is most definitely time for a morning nap. Shungile sleeping off a full belly of buffalo with her mom below and Hosanna somewhere else in the distance. And what a special morning it has been to have spent with these leopards. It is unbelievably peaceful. I can't describe how lucky we are to actually be able to sit here like this and just enjoy the company of the leopards, listen to the sounds of the bird and enjoy the really beautiful, beautiful view that we have right next to this gorgeous little female leopard. Now, unfortunately, that is bringing time to bring us to the end of our live safari and it is time for us to say farewell to you all. But please join us next week at 11 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Standard Time on Nat Geo Wild, so next week, Sunday evening, and you'll be able to follow the stories of these incredible creatures. And all that's left for me to do is to extend a very warm thank you to all of you for joining us. And thank you so much for sending through your questions and your comments. It just wouldn't be a safari without having all of you on the back as our guests. I'm glad that we've had the privilege once again of enjoying the royal family. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you all next week. Have a fantastic evening, everybody.